Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Today I'm here with Dr. Michael J. Maguire, who is the senior lecturer of my college, Dublin Business School. As we know that the Brexit talks are just around the corner with 29th March approaching soon, let's see what he has to talk about Brexit deals and especially how it's going to affect students like you and me who are already in Ireland or who are aspiring to come to Ireland. So, Doctor, welcome to my channel, first of all. Thank you very all. much. Very, very nice to be here. Great. So, could you please lead us through a few questions? For example, how do you think it's going to affect the lives of people living on the border? Well, Brexit, uh, of course, is... Uh, Brexit is essentially a result of internal divisions within the Conservative Party uh, uh, in London, basically, uh, in England. Um, you know, the, uh, the vast majority of people in Scotland voted to remain. The vast major or the majority of people in uh, Northern Ireland voted to remain. And, you know, there was a very contentious uh, uh, campaign on behalf of the Leave uh, people like Boris Johnson and David Davis and Nigel Farage mm. uh, of UKIP. Yes. Uh, it was based around sort of a nationalist agenda. Yes. Uh, that they were going to reclaim their borders, they were going to have these incredible uh, uh, worldwide uh, deals. And it kind of harked back to the, in some senses, there's a couple of fantastic um, uh, articles written by uh, Fintan O'Toole uh, of the Irish Times on the subject of Brexit, uh, where he, he talks about the idea that this is, in some senses, it's a harking back to uh, an old colonialism. And of course, you know, Ireland was um, subject to 800 years rule by yes. uh, um, the, the British Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, Brexit is this idea that they no longer want to be part of what has become the greatest and most successful peace project in the world, which is the formation of uh, the European Union uh, after World War II, really. And so part of the part of the the agenda for uh, the Brexiteers is this idea of the, that they're going to be able to uh, be in charge of their own laws. They're going and fundamentally a lot of what the Brexiteers have promised the Bre the British people in that uh, in that referendum uh, was kind of unicorn thinking. Uh, there was no basis in fact. Mm -hmm. in relation to what they could or what they couldn't deliver. So in some senses, people who voted for Brexit didn't know what they were voting for. Exactly. They were just voting to leave the European Union. So this will definitely have an effect. It will definitely have an effect because of the integration that has occurred since the establishment of the, uh, of the EU. Uh, it will definitely have an effect because of the Good Friday Agreement mm. that, uh, uh, from 1998, which basically brought 30 years of conflict in Northern Ireland uh, to a close yeah. uh, and has given us peace since. Um, so there is there are uh, quite a lot of uh, there are quite a lot of potential um, uh, bad effects that may arise as a result of Brexit. It will have an effect on not just people who are uh, living here at the moment and living in border counties, but also people who come to visit and people who come to stay and study. There's lots of different issues. I mean, just the other day, I was actually issued by my insurer with a green card for my car. If I wish to travel in Northern Ireland now, I'm going to have to produce this green card to show that I uh, am insured in my car. Amazing. Which is which is a complete. <laughs> which I have no idea where that came from. So mm -hmm. I don't know what I've really answered your question there, but there's definitely going to be a lot of different effects on different uh, parts of society, particularly around, uh, you know, the agricultural sector, the fishing sector, because all of these have been part of a, a European-wide policy, yes. uh, clearly defined the the uh, clearly defined policies and agreements over the last number of years uh, that have evolved over time. And these people uh, who promised Brexit said that they would just immediately, uh, you know, they would uh, immediately replace them. So there's, uh, there's at least four or five hundred pieces of legislation that would need to be passed in the, uh, uh, in the British Parliament to just maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
this is not going to happen. If they can't actually, they've had three or they've had two votes on this on this deal, uh, a deal that the European Union knows is actually the deal that they asked for, and when they went back to sell it to their own parliament, they didn't want it, and it's fundamentally back down to that schism in the break in the Conservative Party itself that has caused this, because David Cameron taught, who was then the, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister he yeah. taught that if he was to call this uh, 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 referendum, that the Eurosceptics, as they were known, who are now the ERG, or the mm -hmm. European Research Group, that they would be immediately uh, 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 disenfranchised, their power would be taken away, because they would see that there was a vast majority mm -hmm. of people who wanted to be in the EU, and unfortunately the whole thing backfired. There was quite a lot of dark money put behind the... Uh, the there was quite a lot of uh, uh, dark money put behind the, uh, the the Leave campaign, the Cambridge Analytica scandal about mm -hmm. personal data, and right. uh, yeah, and also this idea of three hundred and fifty mm -hmm. million euro uh, will be given to the to the NHS written on the side of a bus, which was again all kind of unicorn thinking yes. on behalf of uh, on behalf of, of of those people who were who, but this may not even happen. You know, <laughs> that's the truth. We, we have a deadline of the 29th of April. Indeed. And as of today, and uh, today is the 13th of March. 14th. 14th of March. Uh, I'm a day behind myself. Uh, the, as of as of today, uh, they're talking about Article 50 is the piece of legislation that allows the uh, it allows the uh, uh, UK, United Kingdom, uh, uh, or Great Britain, I suppose, uh, but uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, to actually uh, leave mm -hmm. uh, and what they're talking about now is actually postponing Article 50 because of the impact. There's, there, there, there's several different things that occurred. Originally the question was do we remain or do we leave and then as soon as the, as soon as the um, referendum was over and it was very very it was you constantly hear this figure trotted out about 17 point something million people yeah, voted indeed. for Brexit. Yes. But actually, you never hear anybody make the point about the number of people who didn't, not necessarily voted for Remain, but didn't vote for Brexit because the turnout was quite low for the referendum. So the vast majority of people did not vote for to leave. Mm -hmm. the vast, a lot of people didn't vote at all. Yes. Yeah, because it was a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. So who's going to vote to leave the most successful closed marketplace? You know, the biggest market that we can Indeed. be. Who's going to vote for that? And I mean, the, the questions around it are why, uh, you know, who is, who is uh, what is the agenda uh, behind leaving, uh, apart from this kind of patriotic idea, goes back to colonialism and mm -hmm. empire and all mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, what is the actual uh, motivations? You know, I mean, one of the lead Brexiteers, of course, is uh, J uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, mm -hmm. the guy who wears the top hat mm -hmm. and looks like a throwback to a Bertie Wooster commercial. Uh, or uh, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, uh, uh, part part of uh, that guy, he has a he has a he's a private uh, equity firm that is set up in Dublin, that uh, 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 Somerset Capital, I think it's called. Uh, now, okay. is it in his interest? Because uh, I mean, Nigel Farage is married to a German uh, lady who has a German past. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of subterfuge. There's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, it's not as clear cut. Uh, at any level mm -hmm. as, as it was supposed to be and I mean there's definitely quite a lot of disenfranchised people in the United Kingdom uh, and you know it was I think it was part partly uh, the fact that the, the finger was pointed at the EU mm -hmm. that it was their fault that these people were disenfranchised mm -hmm. not the years of austerity imposed by the Conservatives mm -hmm. not the uh, the difficulties that occurred in their own economy as mm -hmm. a result of a, of, of a a, a global crash, mm -hmm. uh, and so it was easy to blame the foreigner, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that the, the British Empire is fantastic mm -hmm. at doing, uh, <laughs> you know. And um, so, as a consequence of that, uh, we have a situation where uh, uh, I really I'm not a hundred percent sure that this is going to pan out in in the way that we originally mm. thought. Sorry, that's a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I that brings me to my next point that. How do you think it's the Brexit, the whole confusion around Brexit that you just mentioned, is going to affect the educational institutions in Ireland or the employment sector in Ireland? 
because after Brexit, we are the only English speaking country left in the EU. Yeah, and a lot of people make it, uh, you know, a lot of people make that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, a lot of the major American companies are moving to Dublin here, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the banks, mm -hmm. uh, because again, they want to be within the European market. Of course. Um, so, as you say, English speaking. So, I think that uh, there is, they talk about a Brexit dividend for Dublin. Um, you know, international capital moves wherever it can. Uh, it, 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 uh, it moves wherever it can. It can best achieve its profits. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, it's it's a capitalist system. It's not about social uh, uh, goodness or anything like that. It's the, mm -hmm. it, it's essentially about making money. And we will go. We will bring our we will bring our assets and register our assets in a place that allows mm -hmm. us to make the most from that. There will be an effect on education. Uh, because fundamentally, uh, now, uh, places like here, uh, we are a, a private college, we're a fee-paying college. Mm. Um, for some people, we could become a lot more attractive, uh, not just because we're the, but I mean, from people outside the EU, we're definitely the most attractive. We've traditionally, here in Ireland, we've had a long tradition of uh, uh, scholarship uh, and uh, an inward scholarship from Spain, from Germany, from France. So there is a we've got fantastic uh, uh, educational reputation abroad, because obviously back in the seventh century, uh, you know we were known as the land of saints and scholars, because while while the the dark ages were 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 uh, taking place on the main continent of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Irish monasteries. I mean everybody goes to see the. Book of Kells. Yes. So there were a lot of manuscripts. There were a lot of knowledge was saved mm -hmm. as a result of it being here in Ireland. And then, of course, we had lots of Irish missionaries. We had lots of, uh, you know, the Catholic Church was very strong here. Indeed. And you know, so they carry the message, and we have this kind of uh, educational and scholarly uh, thing uh, that's been going on for years. So we have a good, you know, we we are our, our our international and global reputation is one that's associated with education. Um. And now it's one associated with technology as well, because all of the major, as you're aware, all of the major uh, technology companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, they all have their European headquarters here. Yes. Um, I think part of what has happened is, especially in if you look at the UK, uh, a lot of Japanese companies who wanted entry to the European, European market, market, had plants in Sunderland, had plants, and now they've decided not to do that anymore. I mean, this is... This is this is something that they should have been aware of, that, that these people who promoted uh, Brexit should have been aware of. They, there is a drop in numbers, I know, from people coming from Northern Ireland to, to Southern Ireland, again, because questions around fees, questions around exchange rates. The, the British uh, pound is not part of the euro project, mm -hmm. so there's always been an exchange rate there. But there is a there is a potential for uh, you know there is a potential for devaluation of the pound, uh, which would mean uh, you know after Brexit, which would mean that um, for people to come mm -hmm. from Britain to study in Ireland, which has always been you know uh, you know the uh, the Irish built Britain mm -hmm. in the in the sixties. There was a lot of Irish labour was used to build the motorways, to build the canals, Absolutely. all that sort of stuff. Um, you know. Um, so there is a there is a, a tradition there of, of back and forth, you know the second generation Irish mm. people living in uh, living in London who are as British mm. as you can be. There's uh, the the vast majority of people who come and stay in this country are uh, uh, actually British. So we have a lot of the mm. immigrants that we get, yeah. as they call them, uh, the immigrants that we get. The vast majority of them are actually uh, UK residents who are coming here to stay here to have. A life that they probably had in the 60s, 70s in, mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, so yeah, there are definitely quite a lot of, of impacts on education and on jobs. And I mean, there's a lot more detail in there I could talk about, but <laughs> I don't think your viewers maybe want to hear all of that. Yeah. You're grand. So you, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, society there somewhere. So on that note, can I just ask you that, do you think well, Ireland and England already has got a not so good history about social relationship in terms of Catholicism and um, Protestantism and you mentioned the Good Friday Agreement and we have been in peace terms since then. But do you think that the Brexit deals might bring back a social division 
between the two countries once again? Well, I mean, again, this is like the, there's a funny thing that goes on here because there's certain agendas at certain levels that suit people. You know, people at a at a people level, at a social level, at a you know a human level, mm. very rarely. I mean, everyone gets on. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> well, you meet, uh, you know, some some uh, you know, some of the nicest people you could ever meet are both Irish people and British people. You know, there is a small elite. There is a small amount of people whose interest it is in to to benefit from conflict, to to be able to say this person is your enemy. Be wary of them. Uh, you know, and uh, it's not the namaste type of idea <laughs> that 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 is more prevalent mm. uh, in kind of Oriental cultures. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of these divisions are uh, a lot of this animosity uh, is not. People used to think that it was fundamentally about religion, that it was Catholics against Protestants, and it really wasn't that. You know, I mean, that was the. This is my experience of witnessing the troubles. This is my experience of living. Uh, Six miles from the border, yes. um, the you know uh, the difficulty in uh, was that there was a back eight hundred years ago there was a thing called the plantations, which mm -hmm. was basically they took uh, they took English uh, uh, they took English gentry and they gave them land in, in Ireland, mm -hmm. and uh, so these people then became you know what they considered to be indigenous British in Ireland. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. and the uh, the Irish speaking people, there was things introduced called the penal laws, where you weren't allowed to speak your own language, you weren't allowed to attend mass, you weren't allowed to do any of these things, and uh, while all of those were going on, there was a definite suppression of the Irish culture. There was a suppression of the native Irish culture. There was, uh, but I mean, this you know, in uh, when we get. 1916 and independence and all that and 1923 and the setting up of these boundaries that uh, exist as the border now um, the border was drawn so as to create a, 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 a unionist majority in that section so that they could control that part of Ireland mm -hmm. now what has happened is simple demographics has meant that the Catholic population has grown and grown and grown and grown and uh, well, loads of people are groaning now, <laughs> but, but uh, it, it has grown to the point where um, at this at this time the, there's a there's a, a the DUP the, the the Unionist Party that is probably the uh, um, uh, who's in power who's keeping the Conservatives in power at the moment. Uh, uh, you know they have a particular agenda that is around unionism and particular type of culture. But there is also there's a whole lot of things that have gone on in Northern Ireland in the last number of years, particularly around the, uh, uh, um, there was a, 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 a cash for ash scandal, as they call it, around uh, certain politicians claiming. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, it, it's what brought down the storm at the Assembly. The, 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 uh, Northern Ireland should itself be relatively self-governing. It mm -hmm. should, you know, there was the whole idea of devolution, that the power to govern itself was devolved as part of the, uh, was devolved as part of the Good Friday Agreement mm -hmm. to the people in the North could determine their own future. And that is suspended because of these issues around uh, a scandal that was mm -hmm. about uh, millions of pounds being uh, misappropriated and misspent. Now, I don't know who's supposed to be responsible for it or whatever else, but that, that has meant that the people who are in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. have not had a voice in, yeah. except the unionist DUP voice, who are, who are definitely uh, pro-Brexit, pro-Leave, pro-anything. Because you see, part of the Good Fighter Agreement is underpinned by the European Union, by the UK, mm -hmm. and even as well by uh, the USA. So I think that at a, at a, on a human level, uh, we all get along. You know, people get on with people. We have lots of, in Dublin, you get lots of British stag parties. Indeed. You get lots of uh, British hen parties. You get lots of people. There's lots of second generation Irish in, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, all over, um, all over uh, the UK. So there is, there is always going to be, there isn't the same animosity. You're always going to, you, you know, reasonable people are reasonable. Yes. Uh, you know, people who are, uh, you know, uh, who believe in a particular cause or believe in particular kind of republican ideals, mm -hmm. uh, all that sort of stuff, are going to have difficulties with other people who have mm -hmm. loyalist ideals. Uh, they're just going to be. But I mean, we still have managed to be able to reach 
you know, John Hume, who was a great peacemaker in Northern Ireland, said that, you know, the people in Northern Ireland were a deeply divided people. You know, and that goes back from an artificial divide, which is always how the British Empire operated, as you know. It's, it's always been about divide and conquer. Yes, so if you get, So if you can get two people in the same place against each other, you can then go in and conquer those two people because they're too busy fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And you can be on both of their sides as far yeah. as they're concerned. Um, so I think that, I think that uh, you know, at a governmental level, uh, the Irish have played a blinder because we are part of the EU 27. We are Europeans. There's nobody here. There's no consensus in Ireland to leave Europe. Europe is, has been good for us. And now we are net contributors to Europe. We're still quite happy to be part of the European project. Um, Britain has its own issues with its own past and its own present and its own self-identity. And, you know, that's their stuff. <laughs> All right. So on the last question now, after Brexit, economically. OK, well, you know, you, know, you understand that I don't think that the Brexit that was originally envisaged or has been envisaged for the last period of time. Uh, there's two potential scenarios. One is that the Brexit never really happens. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that they remain. And one of the points I was going to make earlier was that after the referendum, there was this new term, these two new terms introduced of a hard Brexit and a soft Brexit. Indeed. Right. So first it was leave. Then there was a oh, hard Brexit or soft Brexit. Hard Brexit is this idea that they crash out of Europe with no deal. So that means the planes stop flying, the pharmaceuticals stop arriving, uh, you know, the cattle stop moving across the borders, the, all these things that will bring an economy, put an economy under pressure. And if there is a no deal uh, crash out Brexit, then it will be an absolute logistical uh, and financial disaster for the UK. And, you know, we'll, you know, they'll talk about the, the, the thing is that it's part of that nostalgia that they have about, you know, well, we'll, we'll, we'll just employ the blitz spirit, mm -hmm. right? Which is fine if you're in the blitz, but there is no blitz. And what they're doing is they're going to create their own economic blitz uh, by inviting, uh, you know, the need to renegotiate literally every uh, area th that governs business society. Uh, laws uh, if they break away from uh, if they break away from the EU so that hard Brexit is going to have a horrendous economic and you know the, so people would say well they, they won't allow that to happen at some level the European uh, Union uh, uh, Michel Barnier and and uh, uh, Juncker and all of these people have allowed the UK uh, as much leeway as they require to do what they need to do the problem up until this point is the UK didn't really know what it wanted. It was a bit schizophrenic in terms of, uh, you know, it wanted, it wanted to leave the club, but it still wanted to keep all the benefits of the club. And then it said, well, no, we're going to leave. We don't want any benefits for anyone. We're going to do great deals with everybody all over the place. Uh, and that's not going to happen either because trade deals take, you know, five, six, seven Indeed. years to do. But still, you had people saying, oh, we can, we can do a Norway-style deal, we can do a, a Canadian-style yeah. These things are not going to happen. If they crash out, then I think what will happen is the European Union will have no, uh, uh, will actually have no alternative but to allow them to crash out. Because you have to remember one thing too. If the UK has a very successful Brexit, which it won't have, but if it had a very successful Brexit, then, you know, maybe some other countries that are somewhat disgruntled with the idea of a large power block of, uh, you know, Germany and France and, you know, a failing Italian economy, uh, you know, a, a Greek economy that was uh, in, in terrible state. All of those areas, you know, maybe a smaller country uh, might uh, say, why am I staying as part of this if Britain has got out and had a fantastic. So it's not even in the EU longer term, medium to longer term interest. For them to have a successful, so in some mm -hmm. senses, why we wouldn't wish it upon them, you know, uh, them having a, a a very poor economic it, it, Brexit having a very poor economic uh, impact on Britain would be a salutary lesson to the twenty seven remaining members not to do it. Indeed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very welcome for your contribution. <laughs> yeah, once again, my friends. So thanks a lot to Doctor for helping us through the Brexit talks and bye-bye for now. <laughs> Thanks a million. Okay. Uh, 
If you like the video, don't forget to like it, share with your friends and subscribe oh. and <laughs> press the bell icon there. So till then, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>